Tonight, uh, we have Julie Soar here from Psychology to talk to us about detecting deception. Um, this is our last Science Cafe of the academic year. We will start up again next year. If any of you guys have topics or faculty that you might like to hear, send me a line. Uh, I'm working on the um, roster this year, uh, next year's roster right now. So if you have ideas, somebody you're thinking might be really good, just let me know and uh, we'll see what we can do. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Julie. Okay, welcome everybody to the Science Cafe and to learning a little bit about detecting deception, although you will not learn how to deceive. So if that's why you're here, you can just exit stage right because that's not what you're gonna learn today. Um, I purposely left that part out for a reason you'll see at the end of the talk. So let me start by telling you why I personally became interested in this topic. Um, why I study deception was actually, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, which is a specialty area in psychology focused on um, assessing individuals who've had various sort of neurological injuries, brain damage, et cetera. And one of the cases that I was seeing as a graduate student, I'd learned a lot about neuroanatomy and neurological disorders. I'd learned about um, uh, head injury, traumatic brain injury, what can happen after traumatic brain injury. And then I was assigned to see a case in our neurology department. And the individual uh, who I was trying to assess did, couldn't seem to hold information for more than a couple of seconds, kept asking me why she was in this room, who I was, where she was, uh, didn't seem to understand anything more than a very brief, simple piece of directions. I couldn't get any test data out of her. She looked very, very impaired in, in every way possible. Uh, kept saying that she could see multiple versions of me and that she wasn't even sure what she was looking at at all times. And my supervisor then pulled me out of the room. He'd been watching me do this assessment and asked me what I was thinking. Well, mostly I looked a lot like this. Like, I have no idea because I know a lot about traumatic brain injury. And from what I met in the, read in the medical records, this person simply had a book fall and hit her on the top of the head at work. And she's completely untestable. She, she seems to be very horrifically impaired. And that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with what we know about traumatic brain injury. It doesn't make sense what we know about recovery. And he said, well, would you like to know that I saw her drive here to this appointment? And again, I made this face. I was experiencing what I will explain later was invalidity shock. In other words, it was sort of what I thought was my very first experience with somebody deliberately trying to deceive me for the purpose of secondary gain. She was trying for workman's compensation, claiming that work needed to compensate her for this very severe injury that she was claiming she experienced. So that got me interested in the topic and having to continue to do forensic oriented work and testify in court, which is something that I absolutely hate, um, but is a necessary part of the job sometimes. I stayed interested in this topic um, for a variety of reasons, but also have ext extended it into my own research um, because I think it is a really important research question. So one thing that you should know, though, um, is that deception is very adaptive. How many of you in here have ever deliberately told some sort of untruth in order to uh, get out of something or get a particular gain or avoid trouble? Or I don't see any hands. Come on. <laughs> We've all done it. It's very adaptive. We see it in animals. Social animals will make false alarm calls so that all the other animals will run away and they can get the hoard of food that they found. So they're not signaling a food signal, they're signaling, hey, there's danger out here, everybody. That's a lie. They're lying so that they can get the food. It turns out actually social animals are also interested in detecting deception and will punish those that they catch being deceptive. But animals will also feign injury or feign death in order to avoid dangers. Um, in the case of birds, a lot of you have probably witnessed the birds that fake the broken wing to lead you away from their nests to protect their, their babies. Um, and feigning death, the good old possum is always the classic example of feigning death to avoid death or injury. Um, so, and in humans too, feigning illness can be very adaptive. How many of you maybe ever described, exaggerated, or wholeheartedly made up symptoms? so that you could not go to school that day or avoid an exam or, again, no hands. Seriously, I saw a few very honest, deceptive people out there. 
who have done those things to avoid duties like work or school or responsibilities, such as not getting a prison sentence because you think your behavior is mitigated by your illness, um, or to get benefits. Those benefits could be money, but those benefits could also be psychological, such as attention and love and care of another person. So an important thing to realize is deception is a really adaptive thing. There's a reason we do it. There are actually lots of famous examples of feigning illness. Um, certainly the literature abounds with examples, everything from Aesop's fables to many Shakespearean stories, even Odysseus um, feigned illness. There are lots and lots of criminal cases where the person has actually been eventually caught trying to be deceptive. So there's famous cases of people um, ex uh, faking psychosis. You've probably heard of those cases, pretending to have schizophrenia, hallucinations, delusions. Um, actually, um, uh, Son of Sam serial killer faked um, a delusional illness to try to avoid persecution. Um, the individual who was responsible for the um, bombing of the Alabama church in the 60s who was prosecuted in 2002 actually tried to fake dementia. So he tried to pretend he had Alzheimer's disease in order to avoid the prosecution so many years later, but was caught trying to fake dementia, which is a particularly hard thing to fake, by the way. Um, but there's also cases in sports. I don't follow sports, so don't ask me a lot of questions about that, but this is an example of faking college football injuries. It's a concern, an article from uh, some sports website that pointed out that a lot of times in um, football and in soccer, there's attempts on the defensive side to fake injuries to slow down the offensive play, slow down the, the speed of the game, and that that's a big concern because you know, it's sort of like the false alarm call. You don't want to say it's fake when it's not fake. You want people to get help, but when it's fake, it leads to outcomes that are unfair. Um, and then there are other cases, for example, this, did anybody recognize this case from this fall? I know it's a still shot, but picture that the guy here who's taken a selfie just knocked down a boulder at a park, a national park, a boulder that's been there for thousands of years. Well, it turned out the backstory there was he was part of a lawsuit where he was claiming severe incapacitating and debilitating physical injuries claiming he couldn't move, he couldn't walk, he couldn't function, and he was trying to win a lawsuit for that. And yet then the world had videotaped evidence that in fact he could hike and run around and knock big boulders down off of, uh, in national parks. So, you know, don't catch yourself on video, I guess, when you're trying to be deceptive is the lesson you want to learn there. Now, in the world of medicine, both mental and physical health, the kind of deception we're often looking at is actually deceiving people about illness. So the presence of symptoms, the presence of disorders or diagnoses. And these are the most commonly feigned symptoms and illnesses across a wide variety of neurological conditions, medical conditions, psychological conditions. So certainly as a neuropsychologist, the one that's usually of most interest to me are cognitive symptoms. People will feign, especially memory. It's very common for people to say they have ho horrible learning, horrible memory, they can't remember things. You can't work very well if you can't learn and remember things. Um, and that is very commonly seen in traumatic brain injury, but also can occur in dementia. And there's a growing literature on slightly older adults feigning early onset dementia and being deceptive about having a, a dementing illness where they have something like, all, might look like Alzheimer's, but it's not Alzheimer's. In college students, actually, there's a growing number of the studies showing and documenting uh, uh, deception with regard to attention or concentration or psychomotor processing speed problems. There the gain might be to access to stimulant medication or to other academic accommodations. So ADHD is a very commonly feigned illness. In psychiatric settings and psychiatric symptoms, it's actually very common to see people over-exaggerating or even um, indicating symptoms they don't have related to depression, anxiety, um, reporting experiences of trauma they did not actually have that aren't documented. Post-traumatic stress disorder is actually a very commonly um, feigned illness, um, unfortunately, in both civilian and non-civilian settings, so even in the, in the veteran population. And then, of course, most of you are probably really familiar with the cases that make the news, which are, you know, people feigning psychosis or feigning that they are incompetent to stand trial because they have hallucinations and delusions. Lest you think that this problem is only in the mental health field, however, it's very important, especially in if you who are in the medical fields, to know that it is very common for people to feign medical symptoms. Extraordinarily common for people to report symptoms they don't have, exaggerate those symptoms, report symptoms that don't make physical or neurological sense, 
or they can't be documented with any external testing, especially when they can be self-reported. So pain, fatigue-related symptoms, weakness-related symptoms, and associated impairment. These are some statistics about, from various studies about how common deception really is. So looking at, again, we'll start with some medical populations. From 10 to 40% of patients who present with pain complaints can be shown to be exaggerating or completely deceiving their healthcare providers and reporting symptoms they don't have. 25 to 40% of patients with unexplained other medical concerns. Up to 40% of individuals planning cog claiming various cognitive impairments after a mild traumatic brain injury, something like a concussion. 20% of military and civilian claims of post-traumatic stress disorder. Up to 30% of psychiatric evaluations that are in a forensic context. So in other words, they are part of either criminal or civil cases where they're going to be held responsible for some behavior. And in studies in the university setting, 20 to 40% of students who are claiming to have ADHD are feigning their symptoms. Now, I hope you find those statistics alarming because that's really high base rate. That's above the base rate for any other of the actual conditions that are up here of pain disorders themselves, of PTSD, of depression, of schizophrenia, of mild traumatic brain injury. So if you are working in the medical field, how many of you are, are interested actually in the medical field broadly? Not as many as I thought would be here. See, I think the medical folks aren't, they think they're, they don't have to worry about this issue, but you'll see that they really do in a second. And how many of you are interested in the mental health field? So you saw Department of Psychology and you said, woo, Department of Psychology, I'm going to come hear the talk. Okay, a few of you. Yeah, you guys have to be. Um, we need to worry about this. It's, it's higher base rate than most of the things we're actually considering when we're figuring diagnostic hypotheses. So it should be something that crosses the mind of every diagnostician because it is so high base rate. Now, so far I've just been talking about deception. Deception about illness, deception about diagnoses, deception about symptoms. But I want to break it down into two categories because this is of, of research interest to me and I think it's really important psychologically as well. When people are trying to deceive people in an other way, other deception, it's a communication style. Remember the adaptive? It's adaptive. You know you don't have that problem, but you're going to present as though you have that problem for the purposes often of an external gain. You want to gain something. I'm going to get money from this guy who hit my car because I'm going to claim that I had whiplash and PTSD and severe amnesia. That's actually a very common situation. They'll claim everything. We'll go for the trifecta. I'm going for physical, mental, and cognitive because you hit my car at 10 miles an hour and dented the fender. Those are very common lawsuits that happen all the time. So that's a conscious, deliberate communication to healthcare providers, to lawyers, to whoever they can find so they can get some money on the basis of that situation. But again, that, that gain could also be to get disability, to get workman's compensation, um, to avoid going to jail, um, to get access to medications. Pain medications, stimulant medications are very common reasons for people to purposely and consciously, deliberately deceive. So that's kind of an other deception because they're not living it. It's not there 24-7, much like the guy with the boulder. He clearly was living his life just fine until he probably was in front of his disability examiner and then he behaved very differently. But the rest of his life, he didn't behave as though he had those impairments or he forgot to perhaps. That's a different kind of deception than self-deception. But there's a growing amount of research, and there actually has been research for decades showing we're, we're fairly good at this too. Self-deception can and does occur. So you're believing the lie. You're believing the mistruth. You're believing the exaggeration. It is also adaptive because it can lead to outcomes that can be reinforcing, but it can also be very harmful, as we'll see in just a second. It is, however, less conscious, less deliberate, it certainly can still have all those external gains, but it's more likely that you will see that in the person all the time because they're not just communicating to others, but rather they believe it themselves. The bottom line there, which I'm constantly banging into my students' heads and hopefully also will bang into your heads, is the behavior is still invalid. Just because someone believes that they have a severe memory impairment doesn't mean they actually have one if they're behaving in an invalid fashion. But we might address it differently if it's conscious and deliberate 
versus if it's something that really they've internalized. So this leads me right to a very, very important point, which is deception does cause harm. Now, certainly my very first experience that led me to be interested in deception when I ah, made my little inv invalidity shock face was, how dare they? I've been fooled. Who would do this? What big fat liar? <laughs> what a faker. I and mean, I had a very emotional response to it. And I'm, my students tend to, the very first time they experience someone being deceptive, it takes a lot to get past that because you have to to be a good clinician and to be a good researcher. You just have to study it. However, it is important to know that deception does, in fact, cause harm. Certainly, other deception causes financial harm. Certainly, insurance premiums go up if everybody who just reports whatever they want gets reimbursed. Um, we're all going to pay for that. If people are, are going on disability, if people are getting insurance coverage for things they don't have. But more importantly, it also diverts funds and services from people who genuinely have these illnesses. Because I don't want you to leave here today believing that I don't think these <laughs> disorders exist. Oh, they do. But when they're watered down by people who don't really have them, and everyone just believes that that's part of the picture, then people who need these services are not getting these services. They're not available for the people who genuinely need them. Not only that, it hampers our understanding of those disorders. So from a research perspective, you really need to care because a fair amount of evidence shows deception is occurring and it's occurring in people who are participating in research projects. So if I'm really interested in understanding a disorder and 20 to 40% of the people in my project don't even have the disorder because they've deceived me and I didn't find that, I'm not gonna learn very much about that disorder. I'm not gonna understand that illness. I'm not gonna help treat it appropriately understand what the cause is. That, is. that is harm to the science and to the treatment of those disorders. Of course, in the lit litigation setting, it hampers administration of justice if people are being deceptive. And more importantly, even self-deception is harmful. So I think most people think of the other deception as, as somehow more harmful. But plenty of research shows that people who are self-deceptive actually will deteriorate in their functioning over time in ways that are very inconsistent with the disorders that they're deceiving themselves about. Instead of recovering, they actually get worse over time. And they also develop mental health problems. They stop functioning. They're less likely to respond to effective treatments or even adhere to those treatments than people who genuinely have those disorders. And they're more likely to actually end up not in the workforce, not being productive members of society and being on disability, even though their illness is not genuine. So self-deception is also very harmful. And so for these reasons, it is a very important thing to study. It's a very important thing to address, and it's a very important thing to detect. So how do we detect it? Well, first of all, we know this from existing research. We really suck at detecting de deception as people. We're horrible at it. This particular study, Bond et al., was a recent meta-analysis. So they looked at lots of reviews. In this case, the deception that they were looking for is the kind that you might think about in the legal setting. Oh, they're lying to us about the crime. They're lying to us about where they were at the time the crime was committed. Let's hook them up to a polygraph. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of that kind of deception, too. Um, but it turns out even the experts who claim that they should be good at telling, I'm interviewing you and I can tell when you're lying because I'm in the CIA or I've been trained. Uh, police aren't better at it, FBI agents aren't better at it, the CIA isn't better at it. We're really horrible at detecting deception from just meeting somebody, from just interviewing them. When it comes to malingering illness, um, without the use of formal, researched, well-validated detection devices, medical professionals, mental health professionals are absolutely horrible at detecting it because they assume that they're not being lied to most of the time. I refer you back to about five slides ago on the base rates of deceptive behavior in patients. You are being lied to a lot of the time in the medical setting. People are deliberately or maybe unconsciously deceiving you about their symptoms. But if most people are assuming they're not being fooled and not being deceived, they're wrong a good portion of the time. Now, I think a, a good contributor to that is what my um, good friend and Canadian colleague, Paul Green, who actually has developed one of the best malingering detection devices in memory, um, what he calls invalidity shock. And he calls it an important diagnostic experience and 
need, uh, something, need for an intervention in clinicians. Healthcare providers, mental health care providers need to get over their invalidity shock. And that's the shock that I described to you at the beginning of this talk. What? There's no way my patients ever present wrong information to me. And if only I could really reach them and have a really good relationship with them, well, of course they would tell me the truth then. Actually, the, the complete opposite occurs. If I really work hard to say, I want to know you and we have a good working relationship and you're motivated to lie to me, you're all the more motivated to give me more because I look like I really understand. And I can tell. Another part of the validity shock is I'd be able to tell if he was lying. So he's not because he's, I can tell he's not. And part of invalidity shock is that worry that my own feelings about invalidity and deception would creep through into the relationship. That if I do actually try to test for it, then I'm confronted with it. I have to say, oh, look, he faked. Ugh, big fat faker. I'm going to get you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you under the bus, and I'm not going to let you get your benefits, and I'm going to tell your mother. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my mom voice sneaks through once in a while. But that's the reaction that some people have. They view it as an emotional response. <gasps> How dare they not be honest with me? So part of being passionate about the research area means I also have to be Im impassionate and not passionate when I see it, because I see it a lot. And instead say, this person has communicated invalidly with me. And I'm going to consider various hypotheses. And I'm not saying he really would. He's probably a really nice guy. Um, but consider hypotheses for why might he be presenting invalidly and, and, and that that is something important to do because deception is very harmful. It could be harmful to others and it could be harmful to him. Now, if any of you are really interested in trying something fun though, if you didn't write down this whole site because you can't see it, you actually, if you just go to the www.newyorktimes.com website and search the words, can you spot the liar? They actually have a cute little interactive quiz where they have people playing um, or describing events in their lives and they're either lying or telling the truth. They've asked them to do that. And there's, the first page just has about 10 of them. I got eight out of 10, yeah. Um, but there's a longer quiz that apparently is a lot harder, so, uh, which I didn't take. But if you're curious, this one is showing more of the things you think about out there in the forensic world about they're lying to me about their history. People do that all the time in the clinic too. Um, but, or they're lying about some past event. And so you just watch the clip and you're supposed to determine whether you can tell who's being deceptive or who's not. It's actually pretty well done little. Uh, to do the longer one, you have to agree to be in their research project, just so you know. And I have no, no conflict of interest. I have no idea who's doing that research. So let's get to the kind of research that I do in order to detect deception because I focus more on the de detection of um, deceived um, illness behavior. So symptoms that are, people are reporting, disorders. Well, we need to make sure, and, and I'll, I'll probably not give you all the details here, but, um, but this is, this is an important um, uh, psychometric slide to think about. We need to make sure that we actually are detecting the people who are deceiving us, but that we're not accidentally calling people uh, fakers or malingerers when they aren't being deceitful. So sensitivity is a word when you have a group of people that you know are malingering, they know, you know they're being deceptive, and you know, oh, well, the score on this test, when they fall above that, in fact, I'm catching them. I'm catching the people who are being deceptive. You want a test that has sensitivity, right? Because we want to catch them. But more importantly, in most circumstances, we want to worry about specificity. Because we don't want to accidentally call somebody deceptive or malingering when they really aren't. So we also have to worry that within that population of people that are not being deceptive, they are actually honestly reporting their symptoms, that the test we're using doesn't accidentally call them malingerers, call them deceptive. And so we definitely want a low number of what we would call false positives. We don't want our test to say, oh, you faked, when in fact you did not. So specificity is a very important feature because of the implications, because there are negative implications to saying somebody's being dishonest with you, right? And, and there's potential litigation kinds of components to that that you want to worry about. We'll not worry about the other two um, categories for right now, just in the interest of time. Um, just enough to say that there are slightly different ways of calculating these numbers, and they, they then it matters the base rate with which the behavior occurs. If you're trying to detect something that's really low base rate, like um, suicidality, or homicidality, 
that you're going to kill somebody. It's really hard to find a test that's sensitive, that actually detects those people. But when you're looking at behaviors that are pretty high base rate, like unfortunately deceptive behavior is, you can find tests where your test has a really high positive predictive accuracy. And that's a good quality in a test. So it's, it's relevant to the base rate of those behaviors. All right, this is what you really wanted to know, and this is what you've been waiting for. Though, again, this is not going to teach you how to be deceptive. So the, the methods of detecting deception that you might be more aware of are the ones that are out there in the forensic world that we do when we're trying to catch liars in court cases. So how many of you have heard of a polygraph, or they get called lie detectors? Um, interestingly, long before I was interested in deception of, of illness, um, as an undergraduate, we had a program in my undergraduate where we went around to, I came to, from a very small rural community, and we went around to a lot of urban areas and did science presentations. And those science presentations looked at um, just different fun science labs that we could show them. Somewhere along the line, my, my psych instructor had gotten a hold of an old um, police polygraph. It was really cute in a metal case. It was gold. Um, and I did the polygraph demonstrations. So I would hook people up to a polygraph. A typical polygraph is going to measure pulse. It'll measure your breathing. So much like, I can't remember this guy's name. Is that Mo? Mo. That's Mo? OK. Um, Mo has the straps on there. The rest of him is hooked up completely wrong. They would not have anything on his head. Um, but it gave you the sense of a polygraph. Um, and I have no idea why they were interrogating poor Mo. Um, but they will measure your breathing, your pulse, and it will also measure um, skin conductance because, because of sweating. Well, what are all those things? Those are autonomic responses when you're stressed out. And the theory is, of course, if I'm purposely lying, it's going to be stressful to me. And so I'm likely to show that I'm lying. And I will show, you know, my pulse will change. I will show sweating. All of these other methods that have been out there in the literature are also based on that. Things like different kinds of facial expressions you might make, um, body language, like apparently you don't gesture as much when you are lying. I don't know, I gesture all the time. Um, your voice pitch will change, apparently it will go higher. Um, your facial expressions will change, supposedly you'll tighten up your lips. You know, keep note of all these things, you, you might need them for your future. Content of your speech, apparently you make a lot shorter sentences, you repeat yourself a lot, you don't use I statements. So there's all these kinds of things you can find that people will say, this is how we can tell if you're being deceptive. But a lot of these are based on really nonspecific responses, right? Stress. So let me tell you about my favorite polygraph example when I was doing those demonstrations. Hooked this girl up. I learned quickly, um, by the way, to not have volunteers to hook people up to a polygraph because most of them had already heard somewhere, and this was decades ago, um, but they'd already heard stuff from TV shows on how to beat a polygraph. And so the people who volunteered were the people that knew how to do it. And they were also the people that were not very stressed out. They didn't have stressful reactions. So they, they could fool me a lot of the time. So I would pick the shy people. I would pick the people who didn't look like they were making a lot of eye contact with me and I would get them to come up. So I picked this nice little shy girl I got her all hooked up. Oh, it took forever to get her to calm down. She was sweating profusely and very uncomfortable. Finally, we got some baseline readings, and I started asking her some questions and asking her to lie to me. But all of a sudden, I hadn't said anything to her. Everything just shot up like crazy. Her pulse changed, and her skin conductance responses were going crazy. I looked at her. She was actually turning bright red. And I said, are you OK? And she said, yes, yes, I'm fine. And her voice changed. Um, and I said, well, you don't seem to be fine unless my equipment's gone wacky, so we've reset a baseline. Afterwards, she, she said, do you want to know what happened? I said, of course I want to know what happened. I, I didn't think my equipment went crazy. She's sitting in a classroom, so picture like a high school classroom. There's all your classmates. She was so nervous that I had turned her like this, and that's the door to the classroom. You high schoolers can relate to this. There's a window in the door. Who walks by when she's all hooked up to this scary weirdo equipment sitting in the front of the classroom but the guy she likes? <laughs> she had a love reaction, love, embarrassment, I don't know, one of those two. And it shot up the lie detection equipment because she was all freaked out over this guy looking in and seeing her hooked up to equipment. And unrequited love reaction, I must say, too. She didn't know if he knew that she liked him. Oh, I heard a long story. The, the point of the... The point of the matter is these kinds of measures are not specific. 
So they might be sensitive because they're sensitive to stress, but they are not specific to lying. They are not specific to deception. So it's hard to detect deceivers unless you have very careful design because some people will just have an emotional reaction to being asked, did you murder so-and-so? Oh, who's not going to react to the word murder? Well, psychopaths aren't going to react to the word murder. And they're people who don't have any emotional response, so we miss them. We can't detect them. Bad sensitivity, bad specificity. Brain imaging, very hot right now, and because I'm a neuroscientist, very curious about it, people are trying to look at, well, if your brain knows it, even though you're not going to say it, the brain will show it. We'll be able to see event-related potentials in response to what you know and don't know, even if you claim with your mouth that you don't know it. Actually, again, specificity is a problem because people who have dense amnesia, people who really do have amnesia, will still show unconsciously in their brain waves that they know information. It just doesn't come forward to conscious retrieval. So again, lack of specificity. These measures are not going to be specific. They're going to have false positives. And that makes them dangerous as ways to detect deception. What about detecting deception of the kind that I'm interested in? Deceiving people about your symptoms. Reporting that you have symptoms you don't have or exaggerating their impairment or their dysfunction be those medical symptoms, neurological symptoms, psychological symptoms. Actually, this is something that psychology, especially neuropsychology, has done very well over the last three decades. We have really worked very hard to develop very sensitive and very specific ways to detect deception of symptoms. In the world of um, self-reported symptoms, which is really how we access a lot of symptoms, including medical symptoms, you can look within interviews and questionnaire data for certain patterns of symptoms that don't make sense given the illness, um, the patterns of symptoms that are so infrequently endorsed that no one would endorse them, unusual symptoms, what I call Hollywood version or soap opera versions of an illness. So people have maybe seen some show where they saw something about head injury or dementia and so they take on that persona. It's completely inaccurate. Most of Hollywood is completely inaccurate about all illnesses. So, when you see a soap opera dementia, it's really quite entertaining, or soap opera amnesia. Also within behavior. So if I'm worried about somebody having attention or memory problems, I'm not just going to ask them if they have attention or memory problems. I'm going to test their attention and memory. And there's decades upon decades of research on how attention works, and how memory works, and how psychomotor processing speed works, and how measures of intelligence work, and how they work with each other where we can look for patterns of changes and patterns of performance that should occur for normal people, for people who actually have neurological illnesses or who have dementia or have traumatic brain injuries. And then we see implausible patterns that make no sense, um, that, that just don't occur in those disorders. There are some physical and neurological text, tests that have also been designed, but I will say with some pride that the medical community is way behind. Um, the psychological community in developing tests to detect deception, even when there's still very high base rate in some medical disorders. The other thing that's important um, um, when, when we focus on, on being a diagnostician is that it's bigger than any one test. So if you're really assessing someone, you're, you're kind of being a detective. You've got to look at the whole picture here. So think of the case I talked about way back at the beginning. You know, knowing that that woman behaved the way she did on the test, coupled with the fact that she drove to the appointment, the scores that she de generated should have indicated that she couldn't feed herself. She should have been in institutionalized care, and yet she drove herself to the appointment from 40 miles away. So that's kind of differences in different across settings, inconsistencies with her report. Um, a very important part of doing assessment is not just giving tests, but also getting medical records. So I've had people who tell me, you know, they've never been to a doctor for this problem before, and I'm sitting with a pile of medical records like this. Like, that's interesting, because you actually, I have at least 20 visits here where you went to report that to doctors prior to your injury. Oh, that can't be right. I'm like, well, I don't know, this is you. So I, you know, so can you, can you tell me why that's incongruent? Why, why does this not, not measure up? So a big part of looking at this is not just one specific detection, deception detection device, but rather looking across the whole pattern of performance when you're a diagnostician. All right, so ac 
accuracy. Um, within the research literature, especially when it comes to um, uh, deceive, deception about symptoms and illness and disorders, there's a lot of those measures, especially of the cognitive realm, that have been really well validated. Not only are they sensitive to deception, but they're also specific to it. They've been tested with populations of people who really have those illnesses, who really do have impairments and dysfunctions. Um, one of the tests um, um, has actually been used with people who have dense amnesia, um, with patients that are institutionalized due to severe dementia. Um, and so we know people even with really severe cognitive impairments can, can pull this off. We have tests that are verbal in nature that people who are completely illiterate and cannot read or who speak a completely different language can still do better than some of our malingerers do. Um, so they're, they're, it's indecipherable to them and they still perform better than people who are trying to deceive us about symptoms. Now, the way we actually measure those things in research studies is, again, much like not one measure can detect deception, not one study can tell you that it's a good measure of deception. Multiple, multiple studies need to be done to validate those measures because, again, we want to trust that they're sensitive and that they're specific. Both of those pieces of accuracy are very important. So we do that in multiple studies. Sometimes you might see simulator designs where you actually ask people, like you guys, you know, why don't you pretend to have this illness? I'll let you read a little bit about it. Now let's see if you can do it. Turns out you're usually pretty bad at it. But you know, don't, don't feel bad because it turns out patients are usually pretty bad at it too. Um, and then there are known groups designs where actually, they call them known groups designs, but do you want to guess how many times it is that anybody ever actually admits to you that they were deceptive? I've been in this field for, well, let's just say a long time, and I've twice twice of people admitted to me that they, and that was that feedback when I was confronting them. And they admitted that they were just completely being deliberately deceptive. So it's hard to call these known group designs, but there are ways to design a study where you're picking up on people who are very likely to be um, deceptive, and then does your measure accurately detect that? Now, I keep, I keep using, trying to use the word deception, I keep occasionally using the word malingering. I want to refer you back to the self versus other deception. Just because somebody performs poorly on a measure that's detecting invalidity or deception does not mean the same thing as malingering. Why? What was an important part of that other deception? Malingering. My own students, since no one else seems to know, oh my God, they're showing me panicked faces. Yes. Secondary well, secondary gain can still happen in self-deception too conscious. How do I know that somebody is either doing it deliberately and consciously or whether it's unconscious? Despite the fact that occasionally the word psychology is confused with being psychic, we don't know. I can't tell if somebody's deliberately doing it or not deliberately doing it. It doesn't matter. We don't know that it's deliberate and conscious, but it does mean that it's invalid. If somebody performs that way on a really well-developed measure of deception, it's still invalid, whether or not it was deliberate and conscious or whether or not it was unconscious and more of a self-deception. And that is something that it can then not be interpreted as evidence of the disease or evidence of a disorder or a need for compensation if, in fact, it was invalid. All right. So I'm going to make this point. Um, but first, I'm going to point out that what's up here is the main reason why I'm not going to tell you how to be deceptive. <laughs> um, because people are, pretty, are growing sophisticated about this in the days of the internet, in the days of access to information, in the studies that show that lawyers are actually very willing to find this information out and teach their clients on how to deliberately deceive the healthcare providers that they're seeing. And there are a lot of studies that show that that does happen and that lawyers actually think it's their ethical right to do that. Um, there's a lot of coaching going on. And a lot of that coaching is how to realistically present yourself as having an illness and how to avoid deception. So while I joke about I'm not going to teach you how to do it, in fact, it's my ethical obligation not to give you too much information about the kind of measures we use or the measures that are out there. And when you look in the research literature, people are growing ever more careful about showing you what those methods are. Why? Because that's available to anybody. You can Google search right now, you know, certain disorders. How do I get my doctor to believe I have X? And you will find lots of information. Now, fortunately, a lot of it is horrible. 
is actually will not work. I've often thought I should be, I think they call it a troll. I'm a little old, but I'm not sure, but I think that's the right word. And I should go on and purposely give bad information so I could be deceptive so that then they would do the wrong things, but I don't have time for that. Um, but there is a lot of evidence. You can find out how to, how to um, purposely, as, as I said, even decades ago, this one kid I hooked up and we were doing what's called the guilty no to the polygraph when we were doing a guilty knowledge test. And he kept reacting to the, to the wrong items. He actually had stepped out of the room when he was supposed to pretend to steal something from me and he put a tag in his shoe. And so every time he was actually telling the truth, he pushed down on the tack in his shoe. So he felt pain and guess what? Pain would cause him to look like he was lying. So then on the other items, when he really was lying, he didn't push down on the tack. It worked perfectly well. He'd seen it on a TV show and people still do it today to try to avoid detection. Although I would think a smart polygraph user would actually check for that. But, um, so there's inter internet sites that teach you that, but also how to fill out questionnaires, how to answer questions, what to say to a psychologist. I remember working with, um, uh, again, this was decades ago in a neurology department where I was interviewing a veteran um, and he kept looking down in his lap. And so I said, well, what are you looking at? And he said, oh, this card. And it was a card that his social worker had given him that said, if you say these symptoms, they will tell you you have PTSD. Now, in his case, I think he genuinely didn't understand that he was, that that was really trying to deceive me. Because then he did say, well, I'm not even quite sure why I'm telling you this, but they said, if you ask me this, I'm supposed to say that. And I couldn't remember what was on the card, so I brought it with me. So I said, can I keep that? <laughs> he let me have it. Um, but he was being coached what to say in answers to certain questions so that he could have a certain disorder. So it's kind of a, um, an, like the arms race <laughs> where researchers are continuing to develop techniques that are new, that are more sophisticated, that are based on what we know from neuroscience and what we know about cognitive science, and what we know about psychological science. And then with the world out there of folks who want to have access to that information, trying to find it, trying to dig for it, so that they can teach people how to avoid it. Um, so it's a constant um, fight to try to find really sensitive and specific measures that also are really subtle <laughs> and really hard for especially those other, other deceivers to get access to. Um, again, for good reason, not just because somehow it's very satisfying to catch a faker, but rather because it is really an important societal issue, it's an important health issue, it's an important mental health issue, um, and it's really harming what we are learning from research on all sorts of disorders. So it really does have important meaning. That's what I have for you today, but I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Unless I'm out of time, which I have no idea. Well, that's a, it's a very good question. So the question has to do with the, the other, or the self-deception folks. And, and in fact, it's not so much that it will affect their memory, but they're so convinced that they can't remember that they behave in ways that lead them to be very dysfunctional. So even though they actually have really good memories, they may make life decisions because they're convinced they have poor memories. Um, they will behave as though they have poor memories, even though when they're tested, they actually may do fine, or they may in fact do poorly but in ways that don't make sense that show there is still that knowledge up there you're 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 just thinking you can't do it so it's it is very harmful to them to do that and that's why to me that's a bit of growing research interest to me is what leads people to be self-deceptive because it's very very harmful to you to do that there was another hand over here but just thrown back up yeah You know, they're probably better at it than the FBI. Um, actually, I, the, oh, the question was um, having to do with poker players, where they're constantly trying to, um, you know, keep a poker face, I guess would be the best word for it, and that they're looking for behaviors that might signal what people have in their hands. They're using a lot of those techniques that I talked about. They're assuming that certain facial expressions or perhaps 
a little motor tick, or I've watched you long enough to know, you know, this is how you act, but then, oh, you stuck out your tongue. That's a sign sometimes of lying, you know, or biting the lip or supposedly pulling the ear. Um, you know, you didn't do that and now suddenly you're doing that. That's a sign that you're being deceptive. I think they look for that. And I think if you, probably if you know somebody really well, I'm going to assume, and I'm probably completely wrong, that I know my kids really well and I can tell when they're lying. I bet I'm wrong a fair amount of the time. Um, I could tell when my spouse is lying. Um, but I do know them better. So I know their usual behavior and perhaps I can pick up on when that's not true. And I know some of you know my spouse and he would never lie. Um, <laughs> But poker players, if they're spending time with the same people, they probably are pretty reliable at telling based on changes in voice or changes in behavior, hesitations, that something's different this time. Something's off. Does that answer your question? OK. But for the most part, those visual cues, you know, they're also indicators of stress. So if I'm biting my lip, is it because I'm lying or because I'm really upset? Or because I like to bite my lip? <laughs> Other questions? Yeah? In terms of um, someone maybe like a pathological liar who has a lot of like self-deception within themselves, is it ever possibly reach a point where the self-deception can eventually cause that self-deception to become a reality? Um, well, not so much that it causes the disorder. Oh, the question is sort of self-deception so much that it would cause the real behavior. Um, I think that was kind of similar to his question. but. So if I am convinced that I have uh, schizophrenia, I'm not ever going to just suddenly get schizophrenia. I might behave in ways that are very consistent with it. I might become very dysfunctional and impaired, but that doesn't mean I've actually developed the illness. So there's no question people will, will start being very dysfunctional and being very impaired, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the illness. Now, <coughs> sorry, one of the places where I find that interesting um, in the aging population, although I'm, you know, it's, it's still probably relatively rare, although the, the studies haven't been done, that people deceive about dementia. But older adults can become very worried that they're showing signs of dementia. And what they're seeing is it's, it's just normal aging. But they're so worried because maybe a loved one has experienced dementia that they're, oh, I've got dementia, I'm convinced. They notice all their little cognitive errors. Then they're convinced they have it. So then they withdraw. They, 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 I've, I've worked with people who retire, they stop working, they stop going to their social activities. Well, that's not really very good for the brain. So could that then lead them to maybe be more dysfunctional or to maybe develop dementia earlier than they might? Yeah, maybe. But for me to say I have this disorder and then I, that really actually leads to it, no. It leads to a lot of nonspecific symptoms, which in themselves are very debilitating. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, what would you say is the most misdiagnosed illness that a patient might use to accept the Oh, I don't know that I could say one of them is the, I mean, the top ones I listed on there. So from the true physical standpoint, pain disorders, fatigue-based disorders, motor weakness-based disorders, and from the standpoint of psychological disorders, certainly in the, in the world of uh, um, criminal investigation, it's probably psychosis, but Memory is probably the biggest one, and that happens actually in both medical and physical settings. Memory is a very common complaint um, across all ages, across all disorders. Yeah. Yeah, it's very adaptive. Well, our sense, so he's wondering sort of about the evolutionary advantage of deception. I, I, it's pretty clear evolutionary advantage of deception, and that's why it would evolve. That, that you could, you know, so if I can deceive you enough to get a gain of whatever sort that is, it's paid off. If I've, if I've been reinforced for doing it, and it's a, if it's generally low cost in that most people are going to assume that you're honest, you know, so you're, you're you know, might be, very high, high consequences, but low base rate that I'm going to experience them versus a nice little dribble effect of little bits of reinforcement all along. And we know that's very reinforcing to behavior. So just from the standpoint of reinforcement, it, it, it makes evolutionary sense to do that.
you know, I, because I'm not an animal researcher, I, I, I just know that so, there are certainly social animals that are good at it, and they're also good at punishing people they catch, or punishing other animals within their social hierarchy that they catch. So that's where it's certainly, you see the complexities of those behaviors, and it does look like it's thought out. Whereas, you know, like the bird with a broken wing, is, you know, we could argue all day on how conscious or unconscious their behavior is. We don't even know if our own behavior is conscious or unconscious. But it's, it's almost reflexive in its response versus some of the social animals where it seems very deliberate. Yeah. Right, well, it's not so much hiding the data, it's just being careful. Oop, I think I've lost my, there. ooh, it's scary. Um, it's, it's sort of being careful about how much detail you report about the actual patterns that you've detected. Making that available to other researchers, but not writing it right in the, in the article itself. Um, a, as an example, I actually found it interesting when I was looking at other, other means to detect deception, such as in facial expression, I found a quote from Paul Ekman. I, most of you would have heard the name Ekman if you've studied psychology. He's the one that sort of identified universal emotional expressions. And he actually was involved in some research on detection of deception in the face. But he commented specifically, we don't want to tell people very much about, how, about what we're looking for because we don't want it to be then used to then make the research not work. So his quote was much more elegant. I obviously <laughs> paraphrased it. But I thought that was really interesting to see Researchers even outside of my own area are aware that, that there's this delicate balance between what we're learning in science and then how it can be misused by people who are accessing it for, in this case, nefarious purposes, because in this case it's that deliberate deception. Well, I actually don't do um, research with the polygraph anymore. That was something I, I did way long ago. My research is focused specifically on, on deception about medical illnesses and psychological illnesses and neurological illnesses now. And so, it, it, you know, hooking people up while they're filling out a personality questionnaire is not going to tell us very much about just that they might be stressed while filling it out. So that's not going to be helpful information for the kind of deception that I look at. So instead, we, we've done studies that are um, simulator studies where we ask people to simulate illness and look at how they behave. But we've also done studies with patient populations, known group studies where people have already been uh, identified by other sort of diagnostic criteria as being malingering, having malingering behavior, and then what other patterns might we detect that would be these newer methods that might also be sensitive to it and less, less vulnerable to coaching. Ah, I may have misunderstood your question. So is your question about what do I do once I found it? Yeah, that's the next question. Aha, yes. That is not so much of a research question, but it certainly is a clinical question. And I see my students wincing because they've been in that situation before where, um, you know, it, it is hard. It's very hard to talk to people about their invalid data. Um, and again, for me as a clinician, an important part of that is researching it and knowing that I don't know that it was deliberate. I don't know that it was, was deliberately conscious. I don't know that it potentially could be self-deceptive. I just know that right now this data is invalid. It's not helping me understand their presentation, their concerns, their impairments. Um, but, it, but I'm looking as a diagnostician for hypotheses for my, why that might occur. So indeed, I might have data from family. I might have data from medical records, other psychological records that would help me say, well, what can we do next? How can we help this person move forward from what, they, what they're telling me is going on, what it appears their data is showing, what's, what's, the, what's the best thing for this person? Um, even though, of course, their best thing might have been, give me the diagnosis so I can be on disability or have a certain medication or get money. That's not what's really maybe best for them. And if that's not what the data shows, then I have to be honest about it. But it's very hard. Um, and I would say probably 50% of the time it doesn't go well. 
Um, because indeed, when people are deliberately attempting to deceive and you're telling them that you caught them, it, it, yeah, it tends not to go as well as one might hope. <laughs> Well, you know what, I think, uh, I think if I understand your point correctly, that this is an important point, so I'm glad you brought it up, which is that things aren't either or. So um, I, have, I, I actually get a lot of flack as a researcher in this area from my forensic colleagues. In fact, I, I, I swear that when I was coming up for a promotion in tenure, it's like, could you talk to the lawyers? Because I think they cite my work a lot more than anybody else, but you know, they cite it in court. So I, was con I constantly get contact from, oh, I love your study of such and such, or oh, that was a ridiculous. So I've, I'm, I live in the, much like in the political world, I don't live at the extremes, I live in the middle, and therefore both sides hate you because you're a moderate. So I have colleagues who think everything is faked. Oh, everybody's, because they have, in their practices or in their experience, they have such high base rate of deceptive behavior that they see it everywhere. And then I have colleagues who honestly believe that no one, and they're wrong, um, research shows they're wrong, but they believe no one would ever be deceptive. This is anything that somebody says is exactly the truth, no matter what, and therefore, you know, this is what has to happen. And so, when you're sitting in the middle, nobody really likes you. But the other part is, it's not binary. So it's not, yes, you have a disorder, or you're a faker. You can actually have a disorder and be exaggerating it. You can have some little problems that have become so much bigger in your mind, especially in self-deception, that you're exaggerating them. Or have a genuine problem that you really deserve compensation for, but you're so convinced that people aren't going to believe you that you purposely and deliberately exaggerate it to really make your point. Well, you've not done yourself a favor <laughs> because now, you've, now you look invalid on the questionnaire. So can we sort out the degrees? Not very much. Although there's certainly, on some of the tests, you know, again, when people score, let's say a, a, a certain test, they're getting 10% of the items right, and people with Alzheimer's disease who live in institutions can get 90% of the items right, I'm gonna go with that's pretty in extreme invalidity. So there is some dimensionality, but it is hard. Other questions? Yes? like a response to medication. The, the question has to do with, at, at some point do um, doctors, in this case your example was schizophrenia, so perhaps a psychiatrist, um, if, if they started treating somebody on the basis of what wasn't a real illness, do they actually maybe eventually realize it? I think the most important part about your question is actually a term called iatrogenic illness. And that is that we do know that when people deceive and doctors don't catch it, either mental health or physical health doctors, and then they treat them with things that actually themselves have terrible side effects, such as some medications, or give them surgeries, like um, dis, uh, uh, deceptions about um, pain disorders can often lead to very, very unnecessary surgeries, and they can then introduce symptoms. Um, iatrogen, iatrogenic illness is when the illness is caused by the doctor's behavior. And so in those cases, I mean, some of those medications have horrible side effects. So they can lead, in a sense, I guess this could be part of your question too. It can lead to problems because they were treated for something that actually wasn't real and then led to actual problems later. Um, and again, that's, that is a big problem in, in medic, the medical field, the neurological field, the psychological field, is iatrogenic illness, doctor-induced. And some of it is partly because of that. Yes? Ah, I like, the, I like your question. Her question has to do with punishment, that, that, that people aren't caught. Well, indeed, since most deception goes undetected, no one's going to be punished, not the person who's being deceived. But your question was also about the worker. So in that case where the gentleman brought his little card with symptoms, 
A healthcare provider coached him to do that. Were there any consequences to the healthcare provider? No. Um, and in fact, in many settings, this is actually an important, um, difficult to swallow point, but a very important point is what I informally call secondary malingering, for want of a better word, which is there's a lot of motivation for others to miss that and to overdiagnose and to not notice the deception because um, then their agency gets money. So um, I've, I've worked in many settings um, outside of Ohio, different kinds of settings even in Ohio, where agencies don't like to refer people to me now because I use detection methods and I detect invalidity. And they don't want to know because then they can't count those people in their coffers as having disorder X, Y, or Z. Um, there's a lot of actual evidence that support groups don't like the idea that we would detect deception, although they should be motivated to be happy for that. I mean, the re resources are getting diluted to people who don't have the illnesses, but instead they're thinking about, well, the more people who have X, the more money we might get, and with the more resources we get to, to, for our support. And lest you think it's only about those folks, there's a fair amount of evidence that researchers are also motivated not to look for deception because their grant money comes in only if people have these disorders. And if 40% if of my people then don't meet my criteria, I can't do research. And what they're forgetting is that's also harmful. If 40% of the people in your sample don't have the disorder you're trying to understand, you're not learning much about the disorder. So I call that sort of second tier deceptive behavior and there's not punishment for it. And on that note, <laughs> we're done. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.